I, I guess we're ready to go. I wanted to welcome you. I'm Cheryl Swinegar, Director of the Economic Growth Program here at the New America Foundation. I want to welcome those in the audience and those who are uh, watching um, via the internet and, and the web. Uh, this, I believe, is a very important discussion we're about ready to have with Jim Fowles and, and Woody Brock about Woody's uh, new book, American Gridlock, Common Sense 101 Solutions uh, to the Economic Crisis. <clears throat> Jim Fowles hardly needs an introduction since he was the founding chairman of New America Foundation's uh, Board of Directors, uh, has distinguished himself for many years as a national and international correspondent at the Atlantic, author of many books and many of my most favorite books, but the author of a forthcoming new book, which I think will be very important, China Airborne, I just happen to have a copy. <laughs> which uh, addresses the important question of whether China will make, be able to make the next leap in its economic growth and development to a more uh, advanced middle, middle income economy without all the breakdowns that usually accompany such a path. But our, but our main guest and main speaker, and, and uh, there'll be a conversation, is H. Woody Brock, a president and founder of the Strategic Economic Decisions, a consulting group that provides economic and financial market analysis. I, I'd like to think of, of uh, Woody as probably the smartest, um, most insightful economist and financial analyst that Washington really doesn't fully know or has totally undervalued in, the, in its experience. I had the pleasure and privilege of hearing Woody talk about his book at the New York Knickerbocker Club a few months ago. And there in an audience of financial titans, including on the left of center Felix Roatten, and on the, on the right of center Byron Wien, formerly of Morgan Stanley, I saw Woody wow people uh, with his intellectual analysis, his brilliant deductive thinking about our present crisis and what to do about it. Uh, what we are about to have is a conversation between one of the most distinguished uh, national correspondents in Washington journalism, international journalism, and one of the most brilliant economists that I've met, H. Woody Brock. So I think it will be a very fruitful and uh, and hopefully engaging discussion. And Jim's going to take over from here. And uh, the essential format is that they're going to have a, a dialogue, a conversation for 40 to 45 minutes. We'll have time for 20 to 25 minutes from additional questions and discussions from the audience. We'll have a little bit of uh, reception and refreshments if you want to stay beyond that. And I'm sure a few additional people will be drifting in as is in Washington, D.C. custom. So, Jim, I'll let you take it from here. Thank you very much, Cheryl. Thank you all for coming. Thanks to uh, my friend Woody Brock for, for honoring New America and Washington, D.C. with his presence. This is a delight for me in many ways. Partly, as Cheryl says, it's because New America was a place that I knew in its infancy when it occupied you know, one one hundredth of its current, uh, its current footprint here physically and also in terms of, of, of policy and intellectual stimulation. So it's been great to see the kinds of sessions it has frequently and, and now uh, Woody is joining us for. Also, having known Woody for quite a while since the late 1980s in Japan when I was living with my family and Woody was doing his work there, I've, I've turned to him for advice a lot. Here is an oddity, or an unusual circumstance, those of you in the Washington log rolling industry will understand. Often blurbs for books are not fully sincere or precise, but I actually did a blurb for Woody's book that exactly expresses why I find, have found it so valuable to listen to him. So I'd like to read to you from my own three sentence blurb uh, in behalf of Woody's book, which is, uh, will suffice for my, my introduction. For decades, Woody Brock has enlightened a select audience with his logically rigorous, factually impeccable analyses of past developments and future trends. Time and again, I've seen his insights prove true, especially in cases where he has challenged the prevailing wisdom of that era. Now, for the first time, he addresses for a general readership. He addresses a general readership 
with a comprehensive assessment of how to cope with the most intractable public problems of our time. I don't agree with every one of his prescriptions, which is why I am all the more sincere in recommending the thoroughness and the rigor of, of his logic. Uh, Woody Brock, as you know, is the founder and principal of Strategic Economic Decisions in uh, Palo Alto. Palo Alto, right? Is that correct? It was. Now we're well, moving. Okay. It's, it's, it's beyond geographical location. It's, it's of the cloud. He has his, uh, his BA, his MS, and his MBA from Harvard, his MA and his PhD from Princeton, and I, I will say no more just because uh, you, will, you will be exposed soon to the quality of, of his thought analysis. Let me start by asking you, Woody, essentially, why did you feel compelled to write this kind of book different from the, very, the, the, the presentations you've done before, and what mainly are you hoping people will take? From your presentation. Well, thank you, everybody, and it's great to be here. I'm not known in Washington at all, and I've got this character and Greg Craig and these two guys as old friends, and unfortunately, that's about it. But it's great to be here. You know, I never wanted to write this book at all. I was ordered to. I got a call from a senior editor, John Whiting, and they said they'd been on a fishing expedition trying to find somebody who was really deep, who was like an organ player who could pull the different stops, because, in fact, I'm not an economist. I've got degrees in the mathematical foundations of p political and moral theory, international relations, history, business school, and God knows what. Economics, I find, you know, I have to do it. But economics, as I will argue later, without politics, without ethics, in other words, without the moral tripos, is almost meaningless. And that's something which Adam Smith would certainly agree with and made crystal clear at his time. Um, this book I was asked to write, at first refused, then I said maybe I really do have a message. So let me just say what the book's trying to do. Three things. Number one is trying to identify some areas, some problems, some substantive issues where we have to solve the problems. That's true of four of the chapters. They range from everything like rethinking fair shares and an ideal state, which is chapter six, the whole notion of the moral tripos. In what society would we all most like to live in? That's the most philosophical. To much more pragmatic things, like what do we do about this lost decade? We're recovering. Our 2% recovery isn't nearly enough to create the jobs we need. What do we do to do it? Next, what do we do about health care? What I mean is the 18% of GDP that goes to health care, double most any other nation, is by some studies due to go to 30 to 30 five percent by big by mid-century and there's an answer whereby you can actually have better health care and much more of it and cut the bill in half it's quite remarkable and i do want to talk about that i started thinking about things other issues how do you prevent perfect financial storms and what i found was using advanced logic and that's what's different using the economics of uncertainty using game theory. John Nash was one of my teachers. Using other things. Let's just call it more advanced deductive logics. You could figure out answers to these big challenges that had the unusual property that they were win-win and did not involve the left and the right at all. So the subtitle of the book is American Gridlock, Why Both the Left and the Right Are Wrong. It's not that they're wrong, it's that by thinking bigger and better we were cross-arguing, and it turns out there are win-win answers that I think my dog would approve of. The reason this is true is the kind of thinking, as you'll see specifically if we talk about it in the case of the Medicare solution. Literally, I, like Euclid, I put down three axioms that we all would agree to. You'll agree with all of them. And it implied that there's one and only one overall solution to the Medicare problem. Now, you may find that astounding, but you'll actually see a proof. But the point about it is, if you don't like the answer, because it's deductive in nature, you have to go back to the axioms, because you can't disagree with the conclusion. This is very unusual in public policy to do this. But that was my training. I was trained by people to think that way. So the point of the book is to say, cheer up. There are answers. They're not answers where the left must either gore the right or the right the left. Everybody can win. The arguments transcend left-right, and thus it becomes possible to break gridlock, which is all about left versus right. So that's really the main goal. Better thinking pays. 
And on the assumption that not all of you have yet read the entire book, uh, unlike me, I'll say that that's something that you'll find rewarding when you read it. The leitmotif we'll come back to later is Woody's very rigorous insistence on the difference between your deductive principles and the way you, uh, you think other people are going about their work, including a critique, which we'll get to, of big data, which you think can be misleading as a way to. Uh, but we'll, we'll save that for a moment. Yeah. What I'd like to do next, Woody, is to contrast You've ticked off a number of, of issues that are often discussed here in DC. In DC. Yes. Contrast the analysis and prescription you're offering with the conventional wisdom of life here. For example, the lost decade. Yes, that's if a good one. Yes, and, and that, you know, if that's discussed in DC, it's, well, we're having recovery, but we're worried about the sort of permanently unemployed and the structural dislocation. What is this DC dialogue missing on the lost decade question? Or how should we think about the lost decade and avoiding it? I'm just trying to think. If, if the president said, Mr. Brock, what can we do to fix the decade? The way I would say it, well, Mr. President, let's make a laundry list of what we want to accomplish. Faster growth, particularly job creative growth, which is not necessarily the case. We want jobs, job, jobs. We want faster growth. Yes? Oh, we don't want to irritate the bond market because we're getting close to that level as Italy has shown, where rates don't go from 3.1 to 3.2, but from 3.1 to 7, and then you have major problems. So we don't want to upset the bond market. Deficits upset the bond market, correct? We're all deficit phobes except for Paul Krugman. Deficits are bad. That's part of the Washington story. So one thing, Mr. President, we cannot do is stimulate using the deficit. We've done that. We're naughty. That can't be done. Now, in my book, I make a very serious point. And it's a non-debatable point. The word deficit has no meaning. None. This is not my point. The most important book since Keynes ever written in macroeconomics by Kenneth Arrow, the genius economic theorist, and Mordecai Kurtz, with whom I work with closely, did the definitive analysis of this for the president back in 1970. The book is called, some, I forget the name, Optimal Fiscal Policy, Rates of Return, and Public Investment. In this, you learn that there is no such thing as a deficit. There are two deficits, good and bad. The deficit that's good, the bond market loves you, and you stimulate the economy with it. The deficit that's bad upsets the bond market, because basically, you're just putting more debt on the shoulders of the kids, who may one day say, hell no, we won't pay, precisely as they brought down two presidents by saying, hell no, we won't go. So the bond market gets jittery and rates go from 4 to 8% to 12 and you're broke. So the point is, I'm just going to outline, if I could, yep. that Mr. President, once you understand the arrow Kurtz distinction, that the word deficit has no meaning unless you qualify it, then, Mr. President, you can have your cake and eat it too. Don't upset the bond market. Fix the infrastructure. Raise productivity. Put the kids to work. Have massive job creation accelerators and multipliers going on. Have it all. Okay. This is what I mean by a non-left wing, right wing. Let's, let's have it all. So what you do is you just understand the following very simple point, and any businessman will understand this. Incidentally, the problem with the Arrow Kurtz book, which is without question the only other book other than Keynes that put the, they put the whole thing together, they unified four fields. The problem was it was very heavy mathematics. So obviously it, it, it just never touched the public, unfortunately. My job is like being a Boswell for Johnson to try to put it into English, because this to me is just common sense. So country A has a deficit of a trillion dollars. I don't think this is a slide, I don't know. Think of country A, the government spends four trillion. The tax receipts are three. In this country, the Fed can't do anything about that. The Treasury has to issue bonds and bills. So now there's more debt. Whether the Fed wishes to buy them in is a different issue. There is more debt. The bond markets get concerned. Deficits are bad. We must cut a deficit. Now, country B, using government accounting, familiar from Washington, is identical. It spends four trillion and has tax receipts of three trillion, but it has no deficit. That's because 
of the four trillion spending, three trillion go to things like interest payments, the military, transfer payments, and stuff like that. Note that that spending, which is not productive, is fully matched by the three trillion tax receipts. The extra trillion goes to, I don't like the word infrastructure, but per the arrow Kurtz theory, it goes to public investment done through private corporations with the property that you only invest if a new, completely uh, independent bank, which appraises all these possible infrastructure projects, electric, uh, electric grids, I don't mean potholes, really big thinking infrastructure, it appraises the rate of return on capital on these. And you don't talk about 18 bullet trains. It doesn't matter how powerful Nancy Pelosi may be. Her train won't get built from LA to San Francisco because a minus 4% rate of return on capital, unlike the interstate highway system, which we think was 12 to 13% measured correctly, not to mention the Louisiana Purchase, which was made Manhattan look expensive. And so you spend the money on not infrastructure, but profitable infrastructure. Now, the good news for America, unlike, say, Switzerland and Japan, to keep putting new roofs on the house every year, we haven't put a new roof on the house for 50 years. Yeah. The more leaky the roof is, the higher the error hertz rate of return on capital is. And remember, what makes this difficult is that the returns from public investment, unlike Jim and I opening an ice cream stand where my dog can figure out you know, how much money we're making, with public investment, what makes it difficult is the spillover effects. The interstate highway system had a high rate of return. You could never get that by charging tolls. Amtrak has a high rate of return properly measured. You laugh at that, but Woody Amtrak raises prices and doesn't pay for itself. It's not supposed to. It makes it possible for many, many billions to get to work in 40 minutes, not four hours. Ask the Indians about the value of that. The GDP is not baked on train platforms. The GDP is baked in offices. You've got to get to work and back. So properly measuring these things, I estimated we really literally could have a Marshall Plan, literally, with a trillion dollars a year up to that, easily justifiable, on stuff we haven't fixed or done or ever created in the past 50 years. England is in our shoes. Switzerland and Japan couldn't avail themselves of this because there isn't much that would have a high rate of return. So the point here is you're borrowing. Conservatives like the fact that private companies are doing the work. But at the broadest level, and then I'll end with this, and this is a bit of a tricky question. That's why I'm being a little long-winded. The most important point about the Arrow Kurtz book, which unified everything, is basically, in my words, it said, stop thinking about the words private and public you rotate between states of the world where, for example, right now, the rate of return on McMansions is what? High or low? Low. Negative. Just don't put your money there. I didn't hear the word public or private. But the rate of return on good infrastructure that gets things going, where we leave our kids the infrastructure of equality we inherited many years ago, is high. At other times, coming back from the war, everybody needed a house. So private investment was big. The private sector ran a big deficit. Yes, bad word. The public sector didn't. Other times, the rate of return, if it's high on public investment and not on private, means you want to have deficits for that. And the private sector, like right now, has a huge surplus. All you want, as Arrow told me, is every night when you go to bed, you want all the nation's capital optimally invested. Now, is that capitalist in the extreme? But I'm the left-wing guy here saying Krugman's right for the wrong reasons that we need spending. Paul Krugman never makes this distinction. So he feeds the right wing with fears of bad deficits. We need good deficits, and they're very possible for this country. So that's the main idea. So before going on to some of these other points, I know that your purpose is not to engage existing Washington rhetoric on its own terms. That, that, that would be I a waste. I can do it, but yeah, it's but, not, so, uh, let's I'm, go beyond yes, it. Yes, so I'm going to ask you to do it for a moment. Sure, because sure, I think sure. that if President Obama or his economic advisors were here, yeah. they'd be saying, the case you made is the case they have tried to make too. The last two State of the Unions have been saying, yeah. public and private together, build our highways, build our space program, et cetera, et cetera. And they would point out to you that for the past, say, two years, 
the reigning panic in political life has been debt panic, deficit yeah, panic. Course. So, so what practical With guidance all due would respect, you give? Yeah. The problem in the debate, as I see it, is that no one is making these distinctions. Let me be more precise about that. You go to the conservatives or to the public and you say, look, we're just being good businessmen here. We're no longer going to call investment spending and productive high return spending. We're not going to call that deficits anymore. We're going to have a capital account. So this is just not and never was deficits. Any business person knows that. They have operating expenses and they have investments. Yeah. South Africa did that. Some governments did it, but we, we don't do it for some reason. That's terribly misleading. Secondly, I don't think they have ever made this point that there are bad deficits. Mm -hmm. Now, it may be difficult in Washington to say that transfer payments are bad, but transfer payments do keep four of us at our jobs in California, but they don't create jobs. The point I missed is the following. If I borrow from the kids a trillion dollars and just pay people to keep their jobs, there, of course, there's no net new job creation, none. If you borrow, and he's the sergeant at arms, and you get a trillion dollar check to fix 14 types of infrastructure, mm -hmm. and we don't mean roads at all, but way beyond that. And incidentally, the case for this is even stronger because there's a nonlinearity. Our infrastructure problems are going critical, we believe, in the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. That means not one bridge a year, I should say a decade falls into the Mississippi River, Minnesota, but 10. And people will really wake up. The point is, when you raise money and give it to this guy, he's going to hire 128 contractors. Each of them will in turn hire 49 subcontractors. And everybody gets put to work. The resources are idle and sitting there right now. What matters is that the projects be certified as having a high expected rate of return. Oh, Woody, uh, oh, that, that. how can we prove they're all going to be profitable? Well, ask the head of Johnson & Johnson how you prove which R&D projects are profitable. The point is there's ways to do this where on average you make a high rate of return. We do it all the time. It's doable. So I'm an optimist. We can have our cake and eat it too. The point is that if the, you tell the conservatives who don't like deficits that you also don't like bad deficits at all, you want good ones, but you want jobs for the kids. Transfer payments won't do it. You need multiplier effects. This, this is common sense, yes? Yes, and so I'm going to, to cover a range of topics. I'm going to move now to a next one without exhausting all this. Health care. Yeah, I would characterize the D.C. debate on health care. The Republicans say anything the government does to be yeah. involved in it is destructive, wasteful, and the Democrats are sort of resigned to its endless escalation in cost, yeah. and so both of them are despairing. What are they both missing? Well, this is where I'm going to ask you if you could look at graphs, and you're going to have to go a little bit back in time, back to the future, to remind yourselves of a supply and demand curve in Eck 101. I'm going to ask you to do that. It's pretty easy. He's a brutal taskmaster, but we can all try. The point is that the healthcare debate, because of the complexity of the whole subject, and healthcare is infinitely complex, primarily for all the reasons pointed out in the definitive article ever written on it, which I think was 1967, again, Kenneth Arrow's famous essay on it, where he got the whole thing. What makes it hard is the nature of the good being produced and consumed, its externalities, the fact that you have to have risk pooling, because we're all risk averse, and none of us can afford to get ill anymore, so we've got to pool our risk. This just changes the kind of economics. You have to use the economics of uncertainty to understand that, which he also invented 10 years before. So the point is, what I'm going to do is just make it. I'm going to start from scratch, and I'm going to lay down three axioms. By that, I mean basic assumptions. And this is the way I was trained. And they're going to be things I want out of a healthcare system. And I hope you'll join me in that you will want them too, and your Labrador retrievers as well. All right. They've got to be easy. And then I'm going to simply tell you there's one and only one way to have your cake and eat it too. And they're astounding. The first axiom is I want a lot of people to have coverage. I'm a socialist. I want university, uh, universal coverage. I'm not saying that people who overreach shouldn't pay higher premiums. I'm just saying, I don't think it's right in the society that's rich for people not to be able to afford health care. Now you're going to say, well, Woody, that would be nice, but you can never afford it. Stop. The axiom is only saying I would like lots more people to be covered. All right? S Obama couldn't agree more. Gosh, Woody, you're left wing. Next, I want to make sure there's no rationing. 
And if there's a lot more demand, I, there has to be a lot more supply. A tricky word, as you'll see in a minute. But yes, when people have more access, to use that awful Washington term, when people have more access, meaning more of us have insurance policies, as you know from op-ed pieces, that since I wrote this, if you're the head of Harvard Medical School or whatever, more and more phones of doctors won't answer. So it's a pyrrhic victory to have insurance when no one's going to see you. Like my friends in Canada, they point to Buffalo and say, that's where we go, but we've got to pay it. Rich people go to Buffalo. They point to Buffalo. They say, great health care. Ten hospitals apparently have been built for Canadians. I don't know. It's crazy. That's rational. The Obamacare bill, which is in detail reviewed in Appendix A of the book, was supply light. No teeth were given to more supply. Lots of teeth were given. In fact, if you're a small businessman and you don't provide coverage, you pay big fines. Correct? We gave teeth to demand, but hope and sort of let's hope that more doctors approve it to the supply side. I was already suggesting an imbalance. Now, I want more people covered. I want the phones to answer. And I want the cost of this whole thing, which you can imagine if given A and B, my God, the cost is going to explode. I want the cost cut at least in half to the nation. There is one and only one way, Mr. President, to have it all. You can do both. You can cut the cost hugely, have far more people not only have access, but get access. Anyone here not like that? Now, in Appendix B, this is proven as a general theorem. It's five pages of mathematics. The editors of John Wiley said to me, Mr. Brock, we can't put equations in your book. Look at it in the airport. No one's going to buy it. After the new science, a National Science Foundation study has been completed. No one will buy a book with equations because the problem is that it has been discovered that, at least in the case of men, math and sex uniquely terrify men because both basically precipitate performance anxiety. You can't <laughs> fake the outcome. No faking for men, right. So they tucked it in the back. They put it in there. But I have a little picture that makes it easy. What you're going to see is quite extraordinary. When I first thought of this, I just assumed it had been proven 100 times. Actually, it hadn't, and I don't understand it. So I'm assuming it has been, but I just haven't had time to find it. The point, however, is public policy. I want you to just go to figure 3.4, a supply and demand graph. Everybody with me? That's on page number five. I just want you to, this is real simple. Everyone sees this? Think of Coca-Cola. Price, quantity of Cokes, OK? You may remember this downward sloping line D. All that means is demand. As you lower the price, there's more demand. So it slopes down. Does everyone see that? Lower the price, out you go in the quantity axis. We cut the price in half, I'll drink twice as many, something like that. Supply is the reverse. The higher the price goes, the more Billy and I will get together and produce more widgets. Sound simple? They cross. That's your supply demand balance. See the price and quantity? That's what everybody here knows. Price will set demand equal to supply. Right. Paul Samuelson, the great economist, Ken Arrow's brother in law, and incidentally, both those two great economists are the blood uncles of Larry Summers. It's known as an unfair genetic advantage. Um, the the um, point here is that most times that I or anyone else studies anything like this, you're interested in how those lines move, because that's the way to understand price changes. Does everybody see this? See, here's the problem. Intuitively, I want to say supply is going to go up. Woody. If supply goes up, demand goes up, because supply always equals demand. That's the paradox. Samuelson used to say, for 10 minutes in our lives, we actually understand the fundamental point of economics, which is that it's not about numbers. It's about curves, these lines moving. What's it mean for the demand curve to move out? All it means is that at every different price, there's more demand than before. That's all it means. The whole line moves out. And you see, when you model that, notice what happens to the crisscross points you get a change in price and quantity. Everyone see that? That's how we use these diagrams. With fancy models, don't matter. That's the basic point. It turns out that there's another way to think about this, which for some reason hasn't been used very much because it wasn't needed. But in healthcare, it is my starting point. What the president really wants 
is to control the explosion of costs as all the woodies get old. The problem is the word cost control, like the word deficit, has no meaning. It's a partial equilibrium concept to use the fancy word. You can impose cost controls and pay doctors 30% less, but the nation can end up spending more on health care because an awful lot of doctors, when that happens, with their $400,000 of debt, will migrate from the fields where we need them into the now brand new, no government interference, field in medicine. The hot new field to go into if you're a burgeoning doctor, and boy does it lucrative, is sex change therapy. Okay? So I don't think we want too much of that. Right. So watch my hand. I want you to look at this. I want you to watch. I want you to compute the product here, the area of the square. So at equilibrium E, I see a price of four, and I see what? How many? I have an hour of it. Four times four is how much? How much did the nation spend? Say $16 billion on call. Right. So far, so good? I'm concerned with expenditure, not cost, because the, it's, as Obama says, it's the 18 plus percent going to 30, which we're, you know, we, we have no Pentagon. We're broke, basically. We've got, he wants to slow that growth. I want it to go way down. Boy, is that ambitious. What are you smoking? Here is the theorem. If every year S, the S line goes out faster than the D line, and what I've done here is give you a sort of 20-year snapshot. D goes out because all the woodies are getting old. But I want S to go out more every year, which is easy to do if you think about it, which we never think about it. So over time, there's a big gap. Does everybody see that? D doesn't go to S goes out more. Please note the new equilibrium. Watch it carefully. You see my finger? Could someone tell me how much we're spending? Oh, is that down 25%? Wait a minute. Are there more doctors or less? Let's look on the quantity yeah. axis. What? You're kidding. Gee, that's a 50% increase in the supply. So your phone gets answered. What's interesting is it doesn't matter what the slopes are. This property is always true. Putting it most simply, what you see in Appendix B, total expenditure. If you let S go out faster, and there are ways to do it, it's all in the book, is a parabola. It goes up and then it goes down to zero. I know you may find that odd. I want you to do an experiment. Think in 1980 of all the phone calls you made and the amount of money you spent per minute. Just freeze it. Scale it up by the amount which population has grown between 1980 and today. Take how much that expenditure on phone calls for all of us was in 1980. It's a share of GDP then. What do you think it is as a share of GDP today? Could someone give me a guess? More or less? Did you hear 90% less? That's the point. In came competition. You, the cozy cartel of Ma Bell changed. You had the baby bells. You had, so I'm not going to go on about this. The point about this, it's a simple point, but it's remarkable that as you go out and out and out, this rectangle down here gets flatter and thinner and thinner. It goes to zero. And that is another way of saying it is the fundamental theorem of progress. Yeah. Progress means S goes out faster than D, so we all end up spending less on Coke. So Jim and I can now go take a trip or buy an iPod, and this goes on for hundreds of years. And healthcare and K-12 education are amongst the only fields I know of yeah. where the reverse of this is true and you have, in effect, a kind of negative productivity. So I'm sorry to be about that. Well, no, hard this is fascinating. I'm going to say something. I'm going to ask a question which I don't want you to answer, okay. because we'll save this for sure. discussion later to move. But you know, this kind of curve, which we're all familiar what, with from economics, assumes decreasing marginal cost, which that's been the difference between healthcare and education, right? But it fits into that. OK, fine. The theorem does not. It's general. I mean, that's the point. We'll, we'll assume that for, for later the discussion. shapes, yes. OK. Here, an another topic you, uh, that I think is very, very different from the prevailing DC view is your rigorous insistence on deduction versus induction. That's a different point. Yes. And your, and your, your hostility to big data. Yes. Uh, so it's, given that this organization is now chaired by my successor, Eric Schmidt of Google, who is uh, the incarnation of big data and its benefits, make the case against big data and its, its misleading yes. use. Yes, I will. 
It's chapter one of the book, and I, I used to think no one would be interested in this, but it turns out people rather like it. It's sort of genuinely interesting. It is an extraordinary fact that if you look through this new book on the 20 great equations of history, which is to say not just physics, but all sorts of things, Nash's theory of bargaining, that virtually anything you can think of, for example, Shannon, who invented the concept of information and axiomatically proved what we mean by information, made the computer possible. He was MIT in the late 30s. Von Neumann, the great genius who invented game theory, mathematized quantum theory and physics, which he never studied, uh, invented the computer, the self-stored computer, formerly known at Princeton, uh, where he ran the Institute for Advanced Study as the uh, Von Neumann machine. Uh, he made the point, if you look back, nothing important, Newton, Arrow in economics, Nash, game theory, Harsani game theory, to each according to his needs, very ethical. What would Mother Teresa do? I axiomatized that says, seven years ago. To each according to his contribution. John Nash's roommate axiomatized that in 1953. It appeared in the Annals of Mathematics Studies. I mean, this is smart people. Everything <coughs> came from deduction. For example, in the Barsh, the, I'm sorry, to me, politics is all about bargaining. In economics, there is none in Adam Smith pure market. Take prices as given, and no wheat farmer can gang up with a neat wheat farmer. There's no bargaining, no threats. But in bargaining, the question is basically who does the dishes how many times a week after dinner, or labor management, or who gets how much of the pie. Using axioms, Nash came up with proof in 1950 that there's one and only one solution function to any bargaining game. It was a formula. The only variable that mattered in determining who gets how much of the pie was the non-observable variable, your relative risk aversion compared to mine in the process of gambling. The ratio of risk aversions, all right. Now, if you had trolled the data for a thousand years, you never would have found that risk aversion would matter to the bargaining problem. You could set up experiment after experiment. Without von Neumann, you couldn't even measure risk aversion. No, actually, Arrow showed how to do that. And Nash came to an answer. Data comes in, as it did to Einstein, in confirming what these geniuses end up with. But the people themselves used axioms and deductions from first principles. The nice thing being, if you don't agree with the outcome, go back and fix the principles. But if they're real smart guys, you'll find their axioms are watertight. This is the essence of genius. The highest form is to prove that given reasonable axioms, there is one and only one solution, so to speak, that satisfies them. That's the hope. Hard to do. Often you can prove there's no solution. Right. Arrow did that in trying to find an ideal voting scheme. So long story short, we're living in a world where whereas in 1900 there were as many streets named after Euclid as there were named after Washington and Jefferson. Remember in Cleveland, Euclid Avenue was the only one. Euclid invented the axiomatic method 300 years before Christ. You all remember geometry. The fact that you find a triangle and the angle some 280 degrees. You call it a left-wing triangle. No, it isn't, idiot. All triangles, <laughs> shut up, next topic. Right? <laughs> it just follows. But Euclid had to invent the method to show this. You sit there and you agree with this five axioms or whatever. I can't remember how many. So that's the point I'm making here. You need the data to confirm it. The most amazing example of this in the history of the world is Einstein. The general theory of relativity, this whole theory of curved space-time, published by him in 1916. He never used data. None of them do. Newton didn't. Newton boasted that he derived in 20 minutes Kepler's laws, but Kepler did <laughs> induce using data. So Einstein comes up with this wacky theory. It makes a prediction that light would be bent by a heavy object. And in the eclipse of the sun in 1919, Sir Arthur Eddington, who held Newton's chair in mathematics at Cambridge, went and tested it with large photographic plates, and it worked. His telegram overnight made Einstein the most important person on Earth for 100 years, which he deserved to be. He offered to send a ship with the heavy plates to Berlin for Einstein to examine it. And famously, Einstein said, Sir Arthur, in a letter that hangs in the Royal Society, you are most generous. People are starving. The World War I is just over. I have absolutely no need to see them. You see, Sir Arthur. The theory is generally covariant, a very important axiom. It had to be right. This is what I'm talking about. My point is the kids today don't even know who Euclid is. 
No one thinks this. We, we're, we're given a spreadsheet. We're given a spreadsheet and told the boss wants results at 5.05 in the afternoon or you're fired. Now, it's bad enough to use induction, which is the, op the reverse, where you look through the data and hope to find the truth. In public policy, especially in Washington, we don't use induction. We use bastardized induction. You on the left find your think tank to give you more facts to fit your view. You on the right find facts to fit your view. It's a dialogue of the deaf. It is a deafening dialogue of the deaf. So that's the answer. So, I'm going back to simplicity. <laughs> I like axioms. My so, dog does too. So, so here's an axiom I would share with you too, as, as, as we are gentlemen who uh, reach our mature years. I, I try to avoid ever having a sentence with the words kids today in it. <laughs> <laughs> I think that, that you're asking for trouble. <laughs> kids today do X, Y, and Z. But let, let me ask you one other thing about the yep. supremacy of deduction. If we assume that the greatest minds in human history have been right in their ability to produce these axioms, what about everybody else and just operating from the gut? Isn't it better to have a bias in favor of fact in general? I don't think gut and fact are the same. I think what is actually gut is that once someone says to you that on a flat plane for every point A and B, there's only one straight line between them, that's an axiom. It's, it's a fact, too. Yes. There's a link between the two. And, and, and data yes. suggests axioms. But the point is it's like a lever and a pulley. What the axiomatic method does is it's a lever and a pulley. You get so much more out of it than you otherwise would. I'm expressing my, myself poorly. What I meant is for most people, if they heard your dismissal of big data, they would be in, then be reduced to their own prejudices and uninformed um, spasms. But no, I think the problem with that is that the big data itself may right. lead them astray. Do you right. see what I mean? They're led astray yes. in either way. But for most people in life, who the hell needs axioms and deductions? Most people go through their life, and it doesn't really matter. But most people voting, if they've heard an issue debated, only in terms of deficits are all terrible, deficits are good, then they suffer from that. I mean, what the arrow thing does in the case of deficits is right. they deduce from first principles. If you want maximal happiness, make sure that you have the right investments in everything, everywhere, and that it's all about profit. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's left wing, because you're concerned with the greatest good of the greatest number. It's right wing in that I'm a real capitalist. I want every penny, public and private, optimally invested. And so I think, do you? So we promise to allow our crowd to ask questions within a few minutes from now. I'm going to suggest two or three topics. You can address any of them or any combination thereof in a couple of minutes. Yeah. Because the other points that are very interesting in your book about volatility, which is the curse of our modern life, whether how your approach would yeah. deal with the curse of volatility. Yeah. Uh, your prescription in chapter six for the good society, yes. how that might Those enter a political discussion and also your symmetry, your argument there's a symmetrical failure between left and right. That's something I, I, I am skeptical about somewhat myself, but, but any, any one, or th one, two, or three of those subjects. I don't have much to say about the last one. Good. I'm not we'll sure if that. I said anything yeah. that it's right. I may have screwed <laughs> up, but I mean, I just don't remember, so yeah. it can't have been big, I don't know. So I volatility said, or the good yeah, society? Yeah, let me say something, both. because in both these cases, there are major advances, and I happen to like ideas, and I think you like ideas. Incidentally, if you haven't noticed it, I'm known for something very unusual, very risky. I talk up to an audience. If I think it's important to know about deductive logic, I tell people. That's not fashionable yeah. when you're a public speaker. Everyone's stupid and you're supposed to talk down. I couldn't disagree <laughs> more. I also agree with Bill Clinton. What matters is whether or not the people serving coffee in the back of the room are listening. That's the beginning. Right. So here we go. I don't want to spend long on the volatility story. There has been a revolution at Stanford. The work of Mordecai Kurtz, again, this is the man that's, that, that held Arrow's chair. He's just retired and also wrote the book with Arrow on fiscal policy. He also worked in game theory. But in the last 15 years, he was so fed up with standard efficient market economics. He don't reject it. You don't reject it. Newton didn't, re I'm sorry, Einstein didn't reject Newton. In true science, you arrive at a new, better theory that includes the earlier theory as a special limiting case. Got it? Einstein's 10 equations, if you just take simple things where there are no black holes and we're throwing a basketball around this room, it reduces to what we call flat space time, sort of normal stuff. When you do that, of those 10 Einstein complicated equations, the coefficients of nine of them go to zero, which is to say they're out of the picture. And all you're left with is Newton's potential function. So really smart people, 
really smart people don't expect to overturn something else. They generalize it. So here we go. The efficient market theory is to me very analogous in economics to what Galileo did with physics. Galileo was brilliant. He understood to understand and to test his concept that mass and gravity were independent. He used a bell jar in which there was no air. And it's true. A feather falls at the rate of a lead ball in a bell jar. Mass and gravity was one of the great findings in history. He was not so stupid as to take this very limited story and apply it in the real world on a thunderstorm where feathers go up and lead balls go down, correct? Yes. Efficient market theory properly understood, which is not by finance professors largely, made the assumption that no one would make mistakes in their probability forecast. I'm going to call this mistakes-free economics, like friction-free <laughs> physics. I mean, Newton added the friction and Lagrange later on. By this, I mean the following. What they were assuming was that the data that's being generated to build your economic models was generated by a, a random process which is known as ergodically stationary in mathematics. All it means is the following. You may have this season's bull and bear markets. You can have things change. Got it? But the way they change can never and never does change. There's no global warming, which changes how the seasons change. There's no Gutenberg press. There's no arrow inventing derivatives in a footnote. There's no rise of China, no advent of OPEC in 1973. But of course, in the real world, it's precisely these structural change which are fascinating. So in the standard classical model of efficient markets, here's what happens. We all crunch the data. And as the Nobel Prize winner last year, Tom Sargent, who was the creator of this, said in the New York Times the day after he got the prize, he said, yes, we assume that using historical data, everybody would arrive at the same forecast, the same betting odds, and they would be gods. He laughs now, but try formulating it without such an assumption. Mm -hmm. This very simplifying assumption led to a complete testable theory, which is a great accomplishment, known as efficient market theory rational expectations. Schiller tested it in 81 against the data. And it could only explain, unfortunately, about 18% of the volatility of the markets. That's not very good. But he didn't know that it was mistake street, because this point's just rarely ever made. So what Kurtz did is to say, wait a minute, maybe it's mistakes, which you have to be wrong about, because you just don't know about global warming. And maybe mistakes are the true source of volatility. So here we go. I want you to think of something. Half this room is 20% high of reality, you guys, in your bet. Your mean probability is, let's say, 20% higher than what the truth will be. You all are 20% below. Got it? The truth emerges. Notice, the quantity of trades will explode because you're all wrong. So you'll change your portfolios, correct? Price won't move because every one of you had a symmetric mistake to somebody else. So you change what you have, but the impact on price is zero. So price volatility was zero. Hint, hint. Suppose like in the biggest such gamble in modern times, our bets on our house prices were all wrong in the same direction. Now, price is really going to drop. Wait, if I were teaching a course on this, what I call the fundamental new theorem of risk, and Kurtz did all of this mathematically and brilliantly, is the following. Let's suppose, number one, there's a big correlated mistake. We're all wrong in the same direction. That's not good for price, correct? Oh, I forgot. Let the banks and the households be the most leveraged in history. Mm -hmm. Woo! 2 plus 2 equals minus 64. Free, let all those idealized arrow hedging markets not work. Four, let's assume you can't hedge most important things in life. 90%, Schiller says, of the big risks which in the arrow classical theory we could all hedge through what are now called derivatives aren't hedgeable. Uh, if you want a mess in your hands, you don't have hedges, you were colossally wrong in your bet, you are massively leveraged. This is a perfect storm, OK? But what this is saying is the following. The current debate about this, I'm blaming James for being a dumb regulator. You're a dumb consumer to buy that house. 
and I don't know, you're a banker and you're just evil. <laughs> Ad hominem criticism, endless op-ed pieces. The problem with this is that any engineer knows these are known as state variables. You can't change them. You're always going to have dumb regulators. Go ask who wrote about this. Is it, who were the emperors of Byzantium? I forget. <laughs> Justinian and Theodora. Railed about the bureaucrats and their stupidity. Greedy households. Gee, join the crowd. <laughs> Bankers that are greedy? The idea that you're more greedy than you were before is, is more, no more absurd than saying kids are more horny than they used to be. Get used to it. The point is you can't change these things. As King Canute so lose courtiers, don't try to stop the waves breaking in the coast of Denmark. Build a seawall. And the seawall, in this case, is leverage. The only mentioned variable I mentioned that you can change is leverage. So in August 58, my dad was a war vet and bought, he bought these things, you know, stocks, and everyone did. Smith Barney, he had to put down 45% margin on the stocks, yes? But then it was a bubble. Three months later, as it's in my book, it was 90. The authorities saw Daddy was getting drunk. They said, Mr. Brock, you're inebriate. We're putting on your seatbelt. <laughs> this time, in the name of deregulation of a form that Adam Smith would not turn in his grave but gyrate, this time, we take off the seatbelt and require zero down payments. The higher prices go. This is the most crazy thing that ever happened. It has nothing to do with left wing, right wing. It's just common. And I show in my book that there's a much deeper level why this is wrong. So that's point number one. We've made a huge understanding of risk by incorporating mistakes as the fundamental propagator of risk, amplified nonlinearly, hugely, by the role of leverage. Being jointly wrong and massively levered is disaster. I want a czar of leverage. It has nothing to do with the Fed, the Fed funds rate that can affect cherry tomato prices. I want a leverage czar. <laughs> OK, number two, the last point was the, the, good the, the, the good society. And then we'll stop and take questions. Yeah. Here, I have a diagram I'd like to give you. This has been my main life's interest. Only now it's becoming relevant. I can talk about it. Before, I had to shut up because no one was interested. If you get, so, so uh, which page? We're on page eight. Okay. I'm sorry, that's the wrong. That's what I just gave you a minute ago. This is just, you know, oh, look, look, everybody. Yeah. Look, everybody. Page look nine. At, look at page nine, everybody. <laughs> see, this was dad. Yeah. Fifty-eight. You see how the margin requirement went in three months from forty-five to ninety. And look at the reserve requirement, which China changes. You know, every what? Every month they govern leverage. Yeah. Look at ours. It looks like a dead patient on the soap opera screen. <laughs> All right, it just doesn't move. Markets know best. They do in certain cases, certainly not in finance, which has nothing to do with economics proper. All right, here we go. I want you to just look at the last slide here on page 14. I personally think this is the most interesting stuff. Now, this is something new I've done since the book, which I think is better and should have been in the book, but that's all right. Everybody's now asking, if you read Foreign Affairs, you read these 50 articles since January the 1st in the Financial Times called Capitalism in Crisis, read Francis Fukuyama's new stuff, The Future of History, everywhere, so even the Harvard Business Review and Fortune magazine, it's all about what system do we want to live under? No, Fukuyama in 89 said, basically, capitalism one, no pun intended, communism zero. In his new piece, published in Foreign Affairs in January, he says he was right. He says even the kids on the Occupy Wall Street, nobody wants communism back. And it's true, with good reason. We now know theoretically as well that the incentives in a communist system are such that you get an ever smaller pie. But he said what he didn't know is that a great debate would be between liberal Western capitalism versus statist authoritarianism capitalism of Brazil, Russia, China, whatever. This is the big new debate. So I just want to talk a little bit about this. Because really, the mistake we make is to, to compare GDP growth. I mean, the, the Nepalese are right. It's a lot more than that. In Shanghai two months ago, I asked an audience of 150 people, please raise your hand if you would not give up 2% growth for a bill of rights. I think three hands went up. <laughs> 
Now, 20 years ago, yeah. I suspect a lot of hands are going, you get rich, you don't want to be carted away in the middle of the night. You want habeas corpus, correct? You want a Bill of Rights. You bet, we're all the same. I don't care what your skin color is. I'm a total Democrat that way. So what happens is, what we really want to know in talking about an optimal system, or the system I'd like to live under, is I want to know what's the right economy, polity, which means government, and constitution. And by looking at this quickly, you get an insight as to whether or not the Asian model is better than ours. The first thing you have to do is go back to Walt Rostow, his book, The Three Stages of Economic Growth, published at MIT, in which he, he it was a very famous book. He showed that all countries can grow at 8% up front. They're starting from nothing. No country has ever grown that fast once it develops. You just, it just doesn't happen. So to compare China and the US in that sense is silly. What you want to do is ask what is the fate of both systems going forward. And what I have found in this new stuff is that both capitalism as we know it and as they know it in statist models suffer from a common problem. Both contain the seeds of their own destruction. The good news is that in our system, it's easy to fix, particularly by this overlap, area B, where politics intrudes into the Constitution and permits a modification of it. Let me be very blunt and quick. The great crisis of the West, diagnosed by economists, is poorly diagnosed. The great crisis of the decline of the West has huge economic consequences, but its origins are strictly political philosophical. We invented a system, and we're going to change it, whereby if I'm running for a re-election against you and you for me, for both of us, it is rational to buy the votes of insecure voters by promising more benefits than the Holy Ghost can pay for. I rem we, you're all shaking your head. You all agree. I mean, this is basic. I remember the New York Times when our unfunded liabilities hit a trillion. It's now 52 trillion. You're probably all better than I am at the numbers. They change all the time. It's absurd. It's, it's, a, it's going to be a disaster. I don't care if it's Sacramento or Greece. It's all the same story. Australia, Holland, and Switzerland have done the most to fix it. If you want to move somewhere, that's going to be maybe better. But that's not the point. We can fix that. In 1800, our ancestors weren't worried about slavery. It was part of life. We learned it's bad. We learned women are as good as men. We changed the Constitution. We improved it. That's the social learning process that Kenneth Boulding used to talk about. Well, I want a constitutional amendment right now, as Switzerland just passed, whereby we aren't ever again allowed to mortgage the future of the children, period. I want a, <laughs> I want a second constitutional amendment the kids in this country, if you want to know about downsizing, hollowing out, and so forth and so on, let me tell you, don't listen to people who say it's due to globalization. That does nothing but add growth and trade. No, that's not it. Don't listen to people who say it's about technology. The new technologies don't create jobs. This is not true. Listen to someone who says, I'm Satan, and I'm going to show you how to wreck the living standards of the middle class. As biceps go out of favor, and skills come in, which is what's been going on for 50 years. I'm going to design an educational system with negative productivity for K-12, so you end up with a bunch of doofuses who can't do anything, unlike Germany, where you're apprenticed at age 14 and 15, and you have a job, and there is no youth unemployment in Germany, and in this country, kids can't get so I'm irate about the hosing of the young, and I want a constitutional requirement that kids have a positive productivity educational system Period. Anyway, so here, the point is, the area A is how government intrudes into the economy. The theorem is, the less it intrudes, the better if you want growth. But it has to provide public goods, and it has to deal with externalities. Adam Smith would agree with both. I'm a capitalist. I don't want government. Yes, you do. Without courts of law, idiot, you can't get your property rights enforced. I mean, this is ridiculous. As far as fair taxes go, since capitalism requires public goods, yeah. you have to deal with how to pay for them fairly, or out come the pitchforks. I'm a capitalist. I don't want to talk about distributive justice. That's Mother Teresa. No, it isn't, idiot. It's you. So I'm not left wing or right wing. This is common sense, right? B 
B is our ability to change the Constitution. In a communist system or in this statist system, the problem is the area B is C. It's crabgrass takes over. There is no Constitution. It's just a rubber stamp. They can ignore it, do what they want. I don't like that. A grows and grows under the statist system because state-owned enterprises, by their very incentive structure, make sure there never can be a Stephen Jobs. Hmm. Right, this is all in the news stuff. Our system has plenty of good going for it, because that doesn't necessarily happen. We can keep this. The problem with our system is what I've already said, this business of giving. If we didn't have an entitlement crisis in this country, and we didn't have the school problems that we have, basically 90% of what we're all upset about would go away. I want a constitutional amendment. We learnt slavery is bad. We've learnt this situation is bad. I want it fixed. Don't say it can't happen. It will. The bond markets will make it happen. The problem with the authoritarian model is A and B grow in a way that slows down growth a lot. The real problem is, and this is the difference, to fix themselves requires that more and more monopolistic single party powers give up their own power to fix society. Now, how likely is it that people with all the power and the influence are going to give it up? That's, I think, a long run. Now, you've probably written much better about this in your book, but I worry about this. I have a, a parallel argument in a slightly different style. Yeah, but it's a worry. Yeah. It's the incentive structure. So anyway, the point about this is I'm going to make one last point, and that's it. But it is, I think, important. We all know on page 15 what's a good economy, OK, in English. You've got four quarts of blueberries, two pounds of flour, some shortening, sugar, water. You have the ingredients, the inputs. We now have eight kinds of economies. Think of them as toaster ovens sitting in front of you. Capitalism, Fabian socialists, think of them all. The best economy, meaning the most efficient, produces the biggest pie. Who wants a system when you get less pie than we could have? So that's evident. Economies also should be stable, like yellow jello. They come back to where they were when they're shocked. I don't see any boarded up windows here and broken windows and burnout buildings, do I? Oh, they are elsewhere. Yeah. In 1955, again, Hurwitch and Arrow proved that Adam Smith economies had an intrinsic stability. I want freedom and privacy in the sense of I don't want people having to know what I'm having for dinner when I buy my chicken <laughs> in the supermarket. And I don't want to get a permission slip like in Dr. Zhivago, go watch the movie. Justice. Lump sum redistribution. The great theorems of economics at the highest level prove that an Adam Smith perfect competition economy alone will satisfy this laundry list. My dog barks twice. We all want this. This is apple pie and motherhood. It's not left wing and right wing to want stability, whatever. What's a good polity? This is what's new. A good government. What is government? Government is not what the books write that somehow in Washington they're supposed to maximize the public happiness. Government is not about that. Government is that you are a California rancher. He's your senator. I am a farmer in Colorado. You're my senator. I want those two to bargain and reach a compromise about how much water each of us gets. You aren't, as John Nash first pointed out, you're not maximizing anything. You're reaching an optimal compromise. Hmm. Don't forget the most important comment on that before Nash in history. The Duc de Talleyrand, leaving Vienna in 1815, said what a great treaty we have signed, which lasted to when? 99 years. It was the best treaty. He said this was a really good treaty. Everyone's leaving furious. In 1919 at Versailles, the French were thrilled at how they screwed the Germans, and you all know what yeah. happened, right? The notion of a good bargaining, and we don't have time today, I have shown you have an efficient, fair and an unbiased. They're the three norms. They're the standards, the yardsticks for how good is the government. Each is an interesting story, but not for today. The point I'm making is we all have known a good economy is measured by how efficient and non-wasteful it is. We can now start talking using game theory about a good government being judged by the nature of the bargaining yeah. compromises. But the problem with that is Bargaining could end up putting me in jail or enslaving me and you. So the Constitution kicks in, and it's a fundamentally, as Jefferson said, an ethical doctrine. Don't forget, Adam Smith was not an economist, and I'm not. 
he, was, he held the chair of moral sciences. Right. Notice all the Constitution does is look at the Bill of Rights. It's symmetries. You're equal to me. She's equal to him. Da 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 da. Yes? We all have equal rights. This has nothing to do with bargaining power. This prevents the day to day Washington bargaining from screwing us and carting us away in the middle of the night. The Asian system, you don't have that. If Prime Minister Lee, whom I love, doesn't like it, you don't write about that topic in your PhD thesis or you never get a job. Secondly, I believe a constitution must deal with the fact that which is now you can prove it formally because of advances. These are all advances. You have to deal with the fact of distributive justice as every kid now knows. You can now show that you must have a progressive tax system. It satisfies all sorts of axioms. The rich should pay a larger share. That's not to say they should pay 80% or anything. And it also doesn't mean that people in the lower half of California should pay nothing. The whole thing today is screwed up. But it's absolutely true that a flat tax, you can't justify at all. The simplest version is the pain of 10% of an income of 1,000 a year is killing to a family, whereas if you have a million a year, it's much less. But there's many other ways of proving this. And everybody accepts the, the Buffett type of concept. But anyway, all I'm then saying is that we're making huge progress in understanding what a good economy is. You want a good polity, you want a good constitution, and you want a good economy. And you want those areas A and B of overlap to be correct. I'm very excited that finally we're able to talk about these things. So I think we're finished. Great. Thank you. Uh, and we have time for one or two questions before our, uh, our and so we take the microphone. How about here, a gentleman in the, with a no jacket and his hand up? Yes. And would you identify yourself, please? Yes, I'm Basil Scarless. Uh, I recently retired from the Foreign Service and I've lived abroad. Uh, and I have a question regarding health care policy. Yes. Uh, you, how would you ex specifically, how would you expand supply? What would be an efficient way to do it in our society? And secondly, what's your view of evidence-based medicine? The second I'm not going to talk about because I don't know much. All right. The first one is interesting. It's a very good question. There's three basic ways you shove the supply curve outward. The first is known as factor stuffing. You tell Harvard Medical School, you haven't changed the number of doctors that you're graduating. I don't know the numbers, but overall it's terrible. We, the federal government, having monopsony power, in 10 years you're going to triple the number of people, especially since 30% of physicians are about to retire, which is another point made in the book. The doctors want more doctors. They're not against it. They know what we face. So you can increase the number of factors where they're needed. But that's minor league. The real story is Walmartization or ATMization. You, have, you, you increase productivity hugely, which has happened in every other sector except this. And basically, one thing I have proposed is you have expert systems. 90% of the reasons we all go to doctors are what? Ordinary. Just basic yes. things. You know the deal. You go in, you wait 30 minutes for the nurse. She takes you in the office. Then the doctor comes in and stands in front of the degrees. My appointment for, for my sore throat was $5 at 575 Park Avenue when I was young. Now it's 500 on it last Christmas Eve, all right? But not good productivity. So the point is, the kinds of things that most of us go to the doctors for are so basic, bluntly low IQ, that freshmen at MIT can program a system today whereby when I go in for $5 in the morning at 4.30 to CVS, there's a booth. Oh, it's not just, it's a booth. They take my blood. Stuff happens to me. I'm talking not to an ordinary intern. They get the best interns to make the wisdom. I'm being looked at, tested. It's checking for all the anomalies that suggest that maybe I have a cancer or something like that. Out comes a prescription of what you should do. And if something's wrong, out comes the phone number, the zip code, and the addresses of the doctors you have to see for your problems. This is all done using the best of thinking. It's delivered in a cheap new manner. It's going to happen. We're just so late with this. It's like saying the ATM machine could have happened 30 years earlier, but we kept it from happening. Well, it did happen. So I think that innovation, productivity growth, as well as more factors are the ways in which you shift supply curves out. And anyone thinking this is not important, it's huge in history. We live 30 times better today than in 1700. That is, it would take 1 30th 
of our time today than it took to spend the whole year for the living standard then. Prior to 1700, we've never known of a single thousand year period when living standards more than doubled. Not one. In 300 years, they've risen 30% because of basically free market incentive based, I hate to say capitalism, I don't like the word, but basically. So I hope that's a partial answer. Three ways to shove it out. Yes. Sir. Up here in the front. Good. <laughs> there is a phenomenon recognized yep. by many of us, I think, called the elasticity of demand. Yes. In medicine. The more the public thinks that medicine can provide, the more they ask for it. The expectation, in fact, the yep. element of expectation is an enormous factor in how the system behaves and how the customer behaves. Yes. Uh, as evidence for that, there is a series of new writings on this subject called Too Much Supply Being Provided. Mm -hmm. This is a problem. When you get a physician, a physician will have, as you just said, a war story. Yours is all about the Cleveland model. Yours is about tort reform. There's nothing wrong with what you're saying. What I'm trying to do is transcend that whole thing. The answer, I'm trying to think of the best answer to show uh, for what you're saying here. The theorem deals with slopes of any kind as long as demand is downward sloping. A proper medical system, Arrow showed this in 67, will always make you pay up front to go to the doctor. So you may want more, but you're not going to waste it. Conversely, everybody will have catastrophic insurance. This follows right out of Arrow's theory of risk aversion. Repeat, nobody would ever run the risk of having their house taken away from them because they're in the hospital and sick. Nobody. Right, so one very important thing for your point about the elasticity is you should pay up front for some of it, right? That does a lot in that sense. But the point I'm trying to make is maybe best indicated by taking an example you didn't make. Let's say we're arguing about tort reform, OK? How does that affect what I'm It has nothing to do with what I'm saying. Wrong. Tort reform will push the demand curve for tests backwards because now we don't have to cover our butt by giving tests about everything. The incentive has changed. I'm no longer paying a million dollars premium. The supply curve of doctors, notice that's a different market, will shift outwards because the doctors who can't stand the risks of lawsuits now won't have that, so they won't get out of business, retire early, whatever. And it's been shown, I mean, obviously, if you can push one demand curve backwards and another supply curve outward, you're on the way to a big victory. So you can take any single aspect of the healthcare crisis and filter it through this general law of what to do to the two lines. Anything will affect it. And what you want is like a constitutional requirement. Everybody reform is judged by what's it do to the two curves. Mm -hmm. That's the way the nation can bring this huge bill way, way down. So I don't know if that's a good answer or not. I'm so, happy to take more. So, more so uh, w w one more question. Yes. So it, do you have a question? Yes. OK, this, and we, have a we have time for a question and an answer, then we have a reception. All right. Um, on page. Identify yourself, please. I'm, I'm Mark Ruenberg. I, I run a news service here in Washington. Yes. On page 13, your yeah. third point. Let's take it out of theory and add the practical answer. Yeah. Politics is about multilateral bargaining between interest groups. Could All right, now hold on. Okay. This is going to be page 13, point, point number three. Point yes. three, right. Yes, okay, yes. good government achieves a good bargaining compromise. We clarify what that means. Yes. What happens when one side and it doesn't matter which side yes. refuses to bargain. Well, that's just redefining the thing. I mean, he, here is how John Nash would answer that. I, I want your answer, not John Nash. <laughs> it would be his, because he's a lot better than I am, believe me. I think he would say the following. Take the basic pie division problem. The way he defined it was, we've got to reach a compromise of the pie. I mean, God damn it, I want it all. Screw you, Woody, I want it all. And we end up with 60, 40, 70, 30, 50, 50, whatever. The Nash solution shows in any case, what that will be, sometimes 80-20, sometimes 50-50. The point is that the rules of the game are if you don't bargain and compromise, you both go away with zero. 
Now, who's going to want to go away with nothing and throw the pie down the drain? That, I think, is maybe the best answer. The incentive structure of the game means that, just as is true in real life, we all do bargain. We may be furious like those guys at the Treaty of Vienna, but I, is that a decent answer? Yeah, yes. I, I think yeah, the mark of a good answer and a good discussion is that it resolves some questions and opens others. So I think by, by that standard, we, need, we owe Woody a great vote of thanks. So, um, so I urge you all to buy and read Woody's book. I urge you to have in the back of your mind a book for next week. And, uh, so, and we have a reception here. But again, thanks for coming. And thanks to Woody for this excellent presentation. Thank you, Jim.